Now, as you do this, you begin to notice a rather curious change in your general feeling of life. You notice that there ceases to be what I would call an interruption or an interval between your experience and yourself. You see, in our ordinary way of using our minds, the chronic sense of strain, the chronic attempt to think about and make sense of what we are feeling is what we call our ego. If you say, I experience my own existence, I am aware constantly of a knower behind and receiving all that is known, then you get this chronic sensation of there being an I, a self, who has all these experiences. And that I or self is what we call the ego. And this chronic sense of strain is our, you might call it our uh, psychological blocking against our experience. The thing that seems to divide us from an external world, from the whole universe. But when in this way the interval begins to diminish, we begin to experience our world as ourselves. There is no interval, there is no interruption between the knower and the known. Just as when we are completely absorbed listening to music or dancing to music, we are not aware of our separation from it. We go right with it. And so in the same way, when the mind responds instantly to what the senses bring, it seems almost as if the mind and what it experiences were one and the same. Now, in a way, of course, this is actually true. We can understand this theoretically, but we don't ordinarily really feel it. For example, you know the old saying, if a tree falls in a forest with nobody listening to it, will there be any noise? Perhaps you know the limericks in which this problem is uh, posed. There was a young man who said, God, I find it exceedingly odd that a tree, as a tree, simply ceases to be when there's no one around in the quad. And the answer was, young man, your astonishment's odd. I'm always around in the quad, so the tree, as a tree, never ceases to be since observed by yours faithfully, God. But this is a great philosophical puzzle for the Western world. Does what we know depend on there being a knower? Now, in a way, obviously, it does. Because when a tree falls in the forest, it suddenly makes vibrations in the air. But those vibrations in the air do not become noise unless they vibrate an eardrum. So, in the same way, the light from the sun does not become light unless it falls on an eye, an eyeball. And two, uh, we could say the, the external world is full of hard things. But nothing is hard except in relation to the soft surface of the human skin. Nothing is heavy except in relation to human muscles. So if there is not a human organism, the world does not appear to us at all as having any of the characteristics which we attach to an external world. In other words, we could say, the sun is light, but only because of eyes. Rocks are hard, but only because of soft fingers. Falling rocks are noisy, but only because of sensitive human ears. We cannot form any idea at all of what the world would be like without an observing mind. Even such things as duration, the span of time, depend upon the human mind to appreciate them. Space depends on a human mind to observe the world from a particular position and so know that there are things which are distant from it. Without this mind, 
there could not be any world that we could think about or conceive or imagine in any way whatsoever. And so this shows in a very clear way that our mind and the external world go together. They are inseparable differences. Taking a cigar which has two distinct ends, but you cannot separate those ends. If I would want to take one of these ends off and break the thing and throw it away, it would still have another end. There would still be two ends there. I could never get rid of the situation of it having two ends. So you see that although the two ends are different, there is just one object. And so in the same way, although there is a difference in a way between the knower and the known, between man and the world, nevertheless, these two go together and they are fundamentally inseparable. And therefore, when our consciousness is responding instantly, without any interval or interruption, without any, shall we say, stopping to think about it, then we have a situation in which we are actually realizing, we are actually feeling the true physical relationship which exists between man and his environment. And this we could call the experience of oneness or unity with the universe, which is the function of meditation. Now, I think it's not difficult to see some very obvious values in this. Because, well, if we live entirely in a world of thought, all the things that we pursue in life tend in a way to become arid and unsatisfactory because we are living in an abstract world. In other words, nobody in his senses is going to eat a menu instead of dinner. Nobody in his senses is going to try and get a satisfactory diet of dollar bills. And yet, you see, dollar bills and menus stand in the same relation, on the one hand to wealth, on the other hand to dinner, the same relation in which thought stands to reality. They represent it, they symbolize reality, but they are in no sense substitutions for it. Yes, you can do a great deal of things if you have a lot of dollar bills, but unless you exchange those dollar bills into real concrete worth, they are of no value to you. And so in the same way, if we try to live in the world of pure thought, we begin to feel a strange, unsatisfactory quality to the world. And this living in pure thought is not something that is only done by, you know, professors and intellectuals and uh, thinking people. Perfectly ordinary people often live in the world of pure thought. As for example, when we pursue certain goals in life, when we say, I want to be successful, I want to be happy, these are really abstractions. Because supposing you become enormously wealthy and you're able to afford three cars and six houses, you can't drive in three cars at once. You can't live in six houses at once. You have a symbol, which we call prestige, of your status. But that is an abstract symbol. You can't really you can't eat prestige. You can't eat success. And so, to overcome that kind of beguilement by the fantasies of thought, not thinking, is an important adjunct to thought. To be able, every so often, to cease the hubbub going on inside one's head and to let talking to oneself stop and come to stillness. You needn't, of course, sit in the meditation posture to do it. This is simply the way it's done by Buddhists, Hindus. You could walk, you could sit in the ordinary way, you could lie in the bathtub and do it. You can lie on your back in bed before you get up in the morning and do it. Just let your mind alone and stop trying to make sense of the world so that there is really something to think about other than thought itself.
It's like if we wrote books about nothing but books. This is, I'm afraid, what a great deal of scholarship is. Books about books about books. So in this way, through meditation, we come to that kind of profound peace which is exhibited in the faces of the Buddhas. I remember particularly some words by Lafcadio Hearn in which he gives a marvelous description of the whole attitude which these faces represent. Each eidolon shaped by human faith remains the shell of a truth eternally divine, and even the shell itself may hold a ghostly power. The soft serenity, the passionless tenderness of these Buddha faces might yet give peace of soul to a West weary of creeds transformed into conventions, eager for the coming of another teacher to proclaim. I have the same feeling for the high as for the low, for the moral as for the immoral, for the depraved as for the virtuous, for those holding sectarian views and false opinions, as for those whose beliefs are good and Now, as you do this, you begin to notice a rather curious change in your general feeling of life. You notice that there ceases to be what I would call an interruption or an interval between your experience and yourself. You see, in our ordinary way of using our minds, the chronic sense of strain, the chronic attempt to think about and make sense of what we are feeling is what we call our ego. If you say, I experience my own existence, I am aware constantly of a no do not become noise unless they vibrate an eardrum. So in the same way, the light from the sun does not become light unless it falls on an eye, an eyeball. And two, uh, we could say the, the external world is full of hard things. But nothing is hard except in relation to the soft surface of the human skin. Nothing is heavy except in relation to human muscles. So if there is not a human organism, the world does not appear to us at all as having any of the characteristics which we attach to an external world. In other words, we could say, the sun is light, but perhaps you know the limericks in which this problem is uh, posed. There was a young man who said, God, I find it exceedingly odd that a tree as a tree simply ceases to be when there's no one around in the quad. And the answer was, young man, your astonishment's odd. I'm always around in the quad, so the tree as a tree never ceases to be since observed by yours faithfully, God. But this is a, a great philosophical puzzle for the Western world. Does what we know depend on there being a knower? Now, in a way, obviously, it does. Because when a tree falls in the forest, it suddenly makes vibrations in the air. But those vibrations in the air begin to experience our world as ourselves. There is no interval, there is no interruption between the knower and the known. Just as when we are completely absorbed listening to music or dancing to music, we are not aware of our separation from it. We go right with it. And so in the same way, when the mind responds instantly to what the senses bring, it seems almost as if the mind and what it experiences were one and the same. Now in a way, of course, this is actually true. We can understand this theoretically, but we don't ordinarily really feel it. For example, you know the old saying, if a tree falls in a forest with nobody listening to it, will there be any noise? Noah, behind and receiving all that is known, then you get this chronic sensation of there being an I, a self, who has all these experiences, and that I or self is what we call the ego. And this 
chronic sense of strain is our, you might call it our uh, psychological blocking against our experience. The thing that seems to divide us from an external world, from the whole universe. But when in this way, the interval begins to diminish, we